This is called the session setup window. This is a little different than some of the other setup stuff. This is all the information it takes to discuss or talk about the session setup, like anything that's going on with the session at all. This can also be found if you go to setup session. So on the menu system, it's under setup session, command two. Now, this shows all the stuff that we just did when we created the session. So you're going to see a couple things here, and then of course there's a bunch more stuff here. We see sample rate, bit depth, the clock source, which on these systems is now internal, but as you get into bigger Pro Tools systems, you will use external clocks uh, syncing. Any system delay, uh, pan depth, the format for audio, uh, and then interleaved. And then over here you see the session start, incoming time, and this is a reference to any of the time code that's being used. Now, your time code rates will only change when you're using video of a different time code. So if you're using video that does not meet the standard time code, you'll see a listing up here of options for, for the listings for time code. Most of the time, as soon as you import the video, it's going to sync to that particular time code. So not something we're going to necessarily do with in this class, but we need to talk about everything else because we need to make sure you guys are savvy on what the heck all this stuff is. So let's just have a conversation. Okay? So to kind of get you familiarized, before we just jump into uh, chapter one, we just need to review a couple things that you should learn and then talk about some things that are a little bit of additional tidbits. Or tidbits. Um, sample rate, what is it? Show of hands, show volunteer, who knows what sample rate? Actually, let's do this. All right, let's do this. Hold that thought. <laughs> Sample rate, bit depth, uh, audio format, and then uh, I'll put you on uh, clock source, and I'll talk about pan depth. Mike, do you happen to know what sample rate is? There, I'm getting. There's a long explanation for it, but I'm going to give you the real. Easy one, but Mike's gonna just hit me up with some info that he knows. So just give me what you know. I know that the sample rate is like the CD quality is a 441, mm -hmm. the D quality is 48, mm -hmm. and there's a couple other we use like 96. Mm -hmm. So, Mike's doing great. Mike's doing great. Yeah. And so here's what happens. Okay. Because only because we have to go to digital for this stuff is this even a thought. Okay. The reason this is a thought is because what we're really doing with sample rate is we are capturing snapshots of the audio. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a little more of an elaborate explanation, and then I'm going to give you the dumb the dumb word. Audio sample rate for dummies. Okay, here's the elaborate version. The elaborate version is it's snapshots of frequencies in a, in a certain rating, and this is all per second. So it's 44.1 kilohertz or snapshots per second. So essentially, what's happening with this is it's 44,000, which is the K, that's what that K stands for. 44,100 samples per second, okay? And then here's the catch. The catch with this is, is this is essentially just like taking a snapshot of anything, like a picture, all right? If it has more, if it has higher resolution, it's gonna always look better than if it has lower resolution. Same thing with audio, except that something comes into play here that gets kind of interesting, all right? So again, I'm on the live version, then I give you the number. Okay, this is a real simple. What is the human hearing range? Twenty to twenty thousand. Yeah, twenty hertz to twenty thousand hertz. Okay, all the way high frequencies, all the way low frequencies. Here's the catch to that. Okay, that's an average. Okay, that is not in any way, shape, or form what your ears hear. 
because our, our, our genetics kind of go into that design, our human hearing is all different. It's all different from one, one to another. As you age, you lose the high frequency curve. So as you age, the follicles that die off in your ears essentially are the ones that are responsible for high frequencies. So you'll have problems hearing higher frequencies as you age. Um, but in, in you know, conjunction with that, a lot of you may have been ex exposed to high volumes of something for some reason. I know when I was growing up, my dad was an air traffic controller, so I grew up off the edge of a runway just watching jets come in and watching jets go out, you know, on a Navy base. That's all I did, you know. I love it. But exposure to loud sounds, right? So my curve is going to be a little different than some of you guys. If you guys have been exposed to anything loud, yes. you know, then there might be a difference in, in some curve. And I know uh, you were mentioning that you work with Southwest. Are you out on the tarmac at all? Yeah. Yeah, so there, there might be some differences, yeah. you know, for you. Yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so absolutely, right? Yeah. So, so, okay, so all I have to say, it's 20 to 20, but it's not real. I mean, it is. Mm -hmm. it, you know, when your baby coming out of the womb and your ears develop fully, probably, yeah, there at that moment. As soon as you start experiencing life, it changes. It really does. But the point of it is, is that 20 to 20 is our range. And there is a theorem, the Nyquist theorem, also known as sampling theory. You should have learned this yeah. in the book. Yeah, so state it for me. It's pretty much states that uh, I think it's anything you need uh, for sample rate has to be dumb due to the, uh, I'm not sure the rest of it. It's, it's due to the uh, low frequency, so it's 44, it's got to be 88. Well, so so here's what happens. It ha the, the way that it works out is in order to sample correctly, you have to, to take du double the sample of the audio frequencies that are being used. Yeah. Because we have 20 to 20, it's double the highest value. The highest value is 20,000 hertz. That's our highest cap. So what they did is they doubled it, which technically would be 40, but there's a mirror image that takes place. Anybody know what a harmonic is? You're a musician of sorts, right? What do you play? Well, no, I just make beats. Anyway. You make beats, okay. But, but do you understand what a harmonic is? Well, it's, um, I, I, I forgot how to explain it. Um, like when it, the, something resonates, the yes. high frequency resonates. Yes, resonation. So because of resonation, what it means is that there is no one pure frequency. Unless you use a sine wave. But if, as soon as you, so here's, everybody's heard of sine wave. It's a thing that goes boo, right? Well, as soon as that sound leaves a speaker, guess what? It resonates and creates harmonics. Even though it's one pitch, it's going to resonate off the wood. It's going to resonate in the room. It's going gonna, it's gonna to build harmonics, okay? It's going to have a harmonic build. Well, here's the catch. Some of the imaging in a harmonic build happens above 20K. Some of the actual pitches happen above 20K, but we don't hear those. What we do hear are the artifacts or the harmonics of them, which are below 20K. So in order for us to effectively represent them, we actually have to do an overage for a concept called the anti-aliasing. You can look it up and learn about it later, but if you want to learn more in depth, that's why it has to be 441 and not just 40. Like masking, say anti-aliasing. Well, anti-aliasing is just making sure that we don't Essentially, we build it over it to make sure we don't in any way, shape, or form exclude. Masking is kind of a, a hidden. This would actually be an exclusion of the, yeah. This would be an exclusion of the frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't want to exclude those frequencies because they still exist in harmonic form. And those harmonics still exist, and there are a portion of the frequency that takes place. So that's why. Okay. Now, in addition to this, okay? HD audio, if you were ever like, what the heck is HD audio? HD audio is simply the doubling of those sample rate frequencies. So as soon as we go up to 88.1, we're in HD audio. We go to 96, which is a duplicate of 48, we're in HD audio. The highest level of HD audio is higher. The duplicate. What's 96 and 96? 96 plus 96? 192. 192, yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's our highest level. Yeah, that's our highest level of HD audio. 192. Record at 192? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I knew about the 96 and 96 Yeah, 96 is a, well, let's just say this. 96 is a great safe place to be for high res audio that's not going to kill your system. 
But guess what produces? Yeah, you need a fast computer and probably yeah, well, you need a lot. You need a lot of hard drive space. It's because it's big space. Yeah. When you use these double sample rates, they're duplicates of the file size. So I know when I was doing forty-four one sessions, I'd have like a five gig session or a ten gig session. Now I have like twenty gig sessions. I have one that's like thirty-six gig session. I'm like, holy cow, this is one song. It's at ninety-six k. There's a lot of stuff in it. But that's where you get that. Now, in the real world, where is this useful? You know, when you have a big studio, when you have a big record contract, when you have that kind of stuff, and you have a means to do it, yeah. When you're when you're recording audio for film, absolutely. Because guess what? You mentioned sample rate in reference to CD and DVD. Blu-ray, 192K. Mm. Blu-ray, full res. You don't see it, and I talk about this a lot in my classes, because they, they, you ever watch the Blu-ray commercial? And sometimes you put in a Blu-ray disc and they have the Blu-ray, you're like, why do they have a Blu-ray commercial? On the Blu-ray disc, obviously I already have Blu-ray. But they'll go. They'll, you'll see the Blu-ray thing, and it's talking about 1080p, you know, full HD 1080p video, and then they just say an HD audio, because because realistically the consumer doesn't know. Because they said 192 kilohertz sample rate of audio. No one knows what that is, <laughs> right? So they just say HD, but that's what it is. HD audio is anything above. The duplicate of 441. So it starts at 88.2, goes to 96, which is the next level. There is a 176, and then there's the 192. Hmm. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of different options. It's anything about the duplicate. Okay, so follow me so far on that. Yeah, okay, see. now that's the, the library version. There's a lot we yeah, can talk about with that. The best version of sample rates I've ever heard. Yeah, well, <laughs> so that's the library version. The simplified version of sample rate is sample rate is. The resolution associated with frequency. So frequency, resolution. Sample rate is what? Frequency, resolution. So guess what? If you go to HD, you have better what? Frequency, resolution. Better frequency, <laughs> resolution. Essentially a better representation of the, the frequencies that are being captured. Which is why there is a quality difference because you hear a better sound at a higher sample rate because you're capturing more samples. Essentially, the same way we were talking about pictures, just a clearer picture, more resolution, right? So, frequency resolution. Now, I gave you bit depth. Yeah. Let's talk about that one. Uh, so, we're going on to bit depth. One thing I was going about bit depth is I know it's a binary digit. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much uh, a certain code for the, uh, for the sound, right? Mm -hmm. It starts from like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. That pretty much doubles as well in quality, right? Yep. An amount of size. It doesn't double. It exponentially doubles, right? It doesn't double. Okay. Ex double is what? Times what? Times two. Times two. Exponentially means to the second power, to okay. the third power, to the fifth power, meaning not just times two, but that number times that many options. I'll tell you why. Here's the reason why. Because uh, the bit depth re refers to how many digits are in the code. How many of you have ever had a locker combination? Right? Yeah. yeah, if you've ever had like a bike lock or a locker combination, you notice like when you're looking at those codes, if they're just a three code, you're like, that's kind of simple. If it's just a four code, it gets a little more complex. If that was like a 10, imagine how hard it would be if that was a 10 code. How long would you have to sit there with it if you didn't know it to try to figure it out? And then guess what? What would it be like if it was a 16 code? How many, you know, 16 digits gives you that many options. Let's change it to 24. How it's not just two times, it's that's thousands of times different. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now we go to 32, and we'll talk about what 32 is, but let's start on just what it is in So you're you're out of the money. Here's the reality of what it is. Bit depth, so here's a elaborate version. Okay. In analog audio, what is the difference between analog audio and, and digital audio? Anybody know? Continuous. Analog is continuous. Well, one is real and one's uh Yes. Yes. Anybody know anything about what's happening? Linear ones, one linear. Well, that's very true. Okay. The recording process of analog is is nonlinear, and it's nonlinear versus linear. Or, you know, the whole that whole idea. The not, but not the sound itself. So if you're listening to what the diff, like if I sat in front of a speaker and I said, oh, I hear analog audio versus I hear digital audio. What is the real difference? No, 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 just about how is it, how are they translating it? You, someone already said binary, okay? What is analog audio represented? 
How is analog audio represented? With a signal with electricity. Yes. So you're on it. Oh, are you saying how, how it depreciates? No, not how it depreciates. Oh. How, how is it even produced? Oh, that's right. um, you're talk, you're talk, you're on it. Current. Yes, current. AC. Yeah, yeah. AC. yeah. Essentially, yeah. Essentially, AC current, which is really a, it is. Direct current. It's represented in voltage. It's represented. Binary is what and what? What is binary? It has two digits, of, two, two, two types of things zero that are used. And one. one and zero. Current is what? Anybody remember this? That was really easy. <laughs> I don't know if you had it. You see the Duracell commercial? What's on a battery? Oh, that's it. Positive and negative. Bingo. Positive and negative. So the representation of analog audio. So analog versus digital. Analog is positive and negative, voltage, current. Digital is ones and zero, binary code. And so that translation has to take place. That's what A, D, D, A conversion is, the analog to digital conversion. And then the digital to analog conversion, back when it comes back out to speakers or out of the headphones, it's converting back. Well, in that whole idea, bit depth, okay? Bit depth is essentially how it represents how many pluses and minuses essentially get put into the code that are in that in that coding. So 16 bits of bit depth are representing realistically, and this is the simplified version, so I'm going to give you in this, this is the dummy version, bit depth is dynamic resolution. What are dynamics? What is dynamic? What is it, if I said, hey, that's dynamic, what does dynamics mean? Well, Say it again. The level of volume. Yes, the volume. The sound. When it's when you're talking dynamics in terms of compression, that's, that's all it means. Okay. That's all it means. Is, is what is the what are the variables of volume? So dynamic resolution, meaning how loud, essentially how loud, yeah, how, how loud, soft. Loud. Yeah. So all that turning it up, turning it down, that is what bit depth is responsible for. So bit depth is dynamic resolution. Sample rate is. Frequency. Frequency resolution. So we have a resolution of the frequency, of what frequencies, and then we have the variations of how loud and how soft. Anybody play with MIDI? Obviously you do some, some, okay. So you know MIDI, what MIDI velocity is, right? Yeah. How many, do you remember how many representations there are? 128, I think. Yeah, 128. Zero counts as a digit, so it's zero through 127, but it's total 128. The difference, there's a huge difference between that and 16, 24, and 32 bit. You on velocity, velocity represents, now I'm just getting to a little tangent here just to give you a parallel. On the keyboard, on a, on a synth, or through MIDI, which is USB or MIDI cable, you only have 128 variables of how loud and how soft. There's only 128 variables of volume. And here's what's killer about that. In those 128 variables of volume, do you notice that there's only 128 variables of volume? Have you ever noticed that there's only 128 variables long? No. You, absolutely not, have you? That stuff I just knew because I read it in some of those. Exactly, but you never <laughs> listened to it and were like, man, I wish there was a higher resolution of how the volume gets represented. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that what you don't get and what you don't know about that is velocity is secured to how much pressure you apply. And when you play a note and you don't have a sustain on, a lot of times it'll decay. That decay gets re-represented in a bit depth as well, in addition. So the audio sample that's being played has its own bit depth, even though the velocity only has 128 variables. So realistically, what the big deal about bit depth is, as I said, we either have 16 digits or we have 24 digits where there's thousands of variable differences, and then we have the 32. We're going to get into the 32. Bit depth is a resolution of what? Dynamics. <laughs> Dynamics, okay. So the real, kick, the real kicker with this is, is that with a better resolution of dynamics, you get more expression. How many of you have ever listened to a band play live? Yeah, and how many of you ever listened to a band on an album? Yeah, the difference, huge difference. You hear that when you're at a show, you hear all the subtleties and the variables of, I mean, I, you know, when I play with a band, one of the things I notice is you could have a song that's three chords, and if you play it dynamically with a lot of dynamic variables, it'll do all sorts of stuff. It'll sound amazing. But if you play that one song and you just even keel it the whole way, 
right? So, so we're adding more expression. So that's why 24-bit in the first place. We have to dumb it down because we can only get 16-bit on CD. We actually had 24-bit on vinyl, which is why some guys are like, vinyl is king, because it, it really it actually had a better resolution. We can get 24 back on Blu-ray now. We can actually get 24 back on DVD now. Um, and 32-bit's a new thing. So here's 32-bit. Here's the spiel on 32-bit. So, you, so, so far you know what sample it is, right? Everybody? You know what bit, bit depth is, right? You can actually record 24-bit though, right? Oh, absolutely. Or frequency. You can yeah, you can record and you can record at 32. Okay. 32 is this. There's not a medium for 32 to be translated on. So let me just clarify this. Clarify by saying this. Nothing, nothing at this point in time. I don't even think Blu-ray will take a 32-bit direct. It'll still dumb down to 24. The reason why it's called float is because all this means is they just gave it a, an extra set of, of digits, of bits above 24. So that if anything degrades the audio to the degree that it loses any bit numbers in terms of dynamics, it'll at least always have 24. Whereas before, when we used Audio Suite and certain plugins, we lost some of the bit depth out of it, and we'd go below 24, which would degrade the quality. So they just said, hey, let's build an overage on it that'll float. It'll float anywhere in there as long as it's above 24, it'll sound amazing. It'll sound like a 24 the whole time. So they just built an overage. Does that make sense? So it's just additional, it gives you an additional benefit to keep you from being great. So essentially you want to use that every chance you get. Now it does make a little bit larger file size, but they're not that bad. So every chance you get, I suggest it. Dynamic. Now, when do you hear the real difference? You hear the real difference in terms of the pumping. You hear the real difference in terms of the expression. You definitely hear, and that's when you're going to get, we'll talk about dithering later. The whole battle with dithering is you hear a difference as things fade out. They'll tend to fade out and towards the bottom because there's not a high resolution of, of levels of dynamic variables, there'll be a cliff that it falls off of when something's fading out. And you're trying to make it seem like it goes seamlessly all the way down to the bottom. Does that make sense? So that, that's kind of where you get a little bit of that, that the, the stuff that you actually hear and you go, oh crap. Now, to give you some sense of idea, cell phones and, and old school telephones, 8-bit. 8-bit. Okay, so that's why they sound like the way they do. Some radios are all the way down to four bit, like walkie talkies. You know, so you're wondering why I why it's so hard to understand somebody. Well, there's two variables that are going into play. One, you're using radio frequencies. Yeah, two, it's a frequency resolution that's coming out of the device just from the microphone to the speaker. The other element is dynamic range. So if you're wondering why sometimes someone's talking to you on a CB radio and it sounds like they're either yelling or they're not. It's because there's not a lot of variables in between. It's not as high resolution as, and it doesn't need to be because it's just a radio and it's getting transmitted over the, over the airwaves. But that's where you're going to get that. So if you've ever, now this is the crazy part, okay? Do you sell phones that are better quality? Better? No, actually they don't. No, because there's not a need for, the problem is, is it's a bigger file size that has to be transmitted. It's more information that has to be transmitted. So there's no need. You know, it's like a required bit. Yeah, exactly. Now, here's another funny thing about this. Um, we have 32, 24, and 16 that are available to us. But you can, with specific processors, they make like software you can do this. I don't, I don't know if you've, ever got it, if you've ever been in a situation where you're like, I need, especially for posts, a lot of the film guys, they're like, I need a, a way to make this sound like a CD radio for the, for the video, for the movie. Sound like someone's on a walkie talkie, they're speaking to someone on a comm. What they'll do is they'll actually run it through a plugin uh, or you can use a third party piece of software that, that literally take the bit out of it. It'll literally make it 4 bit. It'll literally make it 8 bit. It destroys the range. And you can really actually match it up to, the, to literally the quality of what it would be if it was actually on there. So, kind of brilliant how they do that, but, but that's what that's there for. Okay, so who had, what did, you, what did I give you? Um, I did a front man. Oh, I did a Okay, so, so, no, okay, now here's. I don't know if it's better to tell you now or better to tell you later. Um, okay. Remember this. How many of you deal with pictures? Facebook, you know, websites, whatever. You deal with some, you've dealt with a picture, a photo. I'm gonna, I'm, there are going to be some parallels that are really easy just to understand. Photos are a great parallel for audio. Why? Because if you went on the internet and you downloaded a thumbnail and you tried to make it a better resolution, is it even possible? 
Yes or no? Can you make a thumbnail of an image that was this big, something usable if you blow it up and print it out? <laughs> Absolutely. Photoshop and redraw it or something. Yeah, there's, that, there's no way to get the, the image back. Because you because essentially you did you captured it at a small range and you tried to make it bigger. All that is gonna be holding true to this. So if you record at 44.1, you can make it. 96K or 192, but it'll never be a better resolution than 44.1. It'll never sound better. It'll it essentially will have a lot of digital samples inside. You can also record at 16-bit and change the set. Now here's the thing: you can't change the sample rate in the post at this point in time. You can still import. You can create a new session in 96 and import things from a lower resolution. It'll translate it, but it's still not going to sound any better. But from here, you notice you can actually change the bit depth at any time. Like notice that at any time I can change this. Anything that's captured at a lower level can never be raised. Did you have a question about that? Yeah, I was, uh, so it's best to record 32 bit flipped it? Oh, yeah, yeah. From, the, from the top, yeah. Okay. Now here's how I see it. Now a lot of you guys, are, you know, so just follow me on this, okay? Here's how I see it. I don't know if you have parents, most people do. Um, and I don't know if any of your parents were musicians, or if any of your parents were music, you know, gurus. Like maybe they just, kept a lot of records, okay? I My house, before I got married, I had zero records. When I got married, um, my wife had taken records from her grandfather, and I mean, I have a wall of records now. I mean, I have a wall. I mean, it's literally top to bottom, wall. And I'm like, we never listened to them, but they're just, they're so cool. I mean, I'll tell you this, don't ever move records, because those are the heaviest boxes you'll ever lift up with anything that's just solid books. But it's really cool. Here's the downside, okay? Downside is somewhere between vinyl and the next stage, okay, came tapes. And came all those, you know, and even before the vinyl, the vinyl you know, series, they were really dealing with some other kind of weird forms of media, so they got standardized. Here's the problem with it, it, it and you'll notice this. If you take anything old and you want to reuse it, does it usually sound up to par with the quality of where we are now? No. So if you're if you're wondering, should I just do this at the most minimal I can get away with? The answer is, you can, but don't expect to have, to be impressed by this in the next five to ten years. This is why, though, if you've ever heard a re-release of somebody's, I mean, the Beatles, great example. You know, you go watch Love, and all those are remastered and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they were the original recordings. Well, there's a couple things that you have to think about. Why are those recordings so good in the first place? Well, guess what? They were using consoles that are now hundreds of thousands of dollars. Back then, they were using them. They were using these large pieces. I mean, they weren't using the simple little craft. They weren't using the, you know, they weren't doing it cheap. They're, everything they did was like the biggest, most blown out, highest resolution of anything they could have done in their day, which is why now it's still useful. You go to look at any of the other bands, that did it in the day, there's a lot of work that has to take place to get it back to being restored. So all I'm saying is, why would you want to go higher? Because you can expect in the next few years that everything's going to be higher and your stuff's going to want to be somewhere matched to that. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Now obviously, you're still going to have, for me, I have, I have time pretty much. Yeah, you're going to have some stuff that's going to just be like, eh, this isn't work. I mean, is this, this is one thing that I'm going to do? Am I ever going to listen to this again? Maybe not, you know? Um, so that might be one of those decisions you have to make, or if you're working with an artist, you might have to ask them. But that's a good opportunity to talk about that. Now, with the idea in mind that I just said, you can't make it any better, so whatever the smallest version of what it is, the lowest quality you did, that's what it's stuck at. That's what brings me to the next thing that you're going to talk about. The audio format. Is it the file of audio we're doing? Yeah. The kind of file that your audio is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so this audio format is what type of audio, file, essentially the file format that audio will use. Here's the catch. You can change this back and forth all day, but as you change it, whatever it's on, that's what it gets captured at, and then when you change it again, whatever it's on, that's what it gets captured at. So you don't usually want to change this a ton, but I'll say there's a couple reasons I use this, and I change it, and that's when it gets us into the next thing that I'm going to talk about. But that, it's as simple as that. You pick one or the other, and that's your file type. 
Now, AIFF, how many of you have ever worked with a PC before you came to school? Maybe you were a PC user before you came to school? That's what I'm sorry, yeah. Anybody current, you guys are currently PC users? Okay, here's the thing. When I was a Mac user, I'm still a Mac user, but I mean, when, Mac, when being a Mac user meant being a Mac user, now it's like, use a Mac and it's got so much PC stuff on it, and it's like, gosh, I mean, I mean it's to the degree that I almost feel like using a PC. Because before, it didn't have any of that kind of stuff. It didn't give you the opportunity to have it. Well, here's the thing. Six years ago, AIFF was exclusively for Mac. So people used it because it was exclusively for Mac. That's why people used it in the first place. Because it was the, the the Apple version of audio, whereas you guys that use PCs, you have the Windows media files, mm -hmm. which are still the exclusive Windows, well, exclusive PC version of audio. Does that make sense? Those aren't applicable to Macs. They still aren't. But now PCs encoded their stuff, so now they can use the AIFF. So that, so essentially, from a Mac's point of view. Wave has always been the universal between the two, and AIFF is now universal between the two. Using any one of these won't make a, a hill. Uh, a, none of these will be different. And here's the, di the only difference. Wave can be compressed to different levels, and you can't do it inside of Pro Tools, but you can do it inside of iTunes, and you can do it inside of a lot of third-party software. Wave can actually be compressed to a different size of, of file. AIFF is always a high res. So that's the only real difference that so you make. AIFF is better than well, they're both the same quality if they're both at their highest resolution. Okay. Which if you captured it, if you're doing it here, select like between the two, they're both the same. Okay. But you can't actually compress a wave down to a smaller version. You could literally take a wave and go, oh, I want it to be half that size. Okay. And it'll compress it for you that, at that level. It won't do it in Pro Tools, but you can do it in any other software. So that's the only additional element that there is. Otherwise, an AIFF is always stuck at, at, at the high res. Okay. So, you know, there's, that's not really that many benefits to it. I'll say when it comes into play, sometimes you'll run into something that they require. People are picky. You'll have a client that goes, I only want my stuff in Win. I'm like, all right, dude. <laughs> it's all Win. Or they'll say, I only want it in the AI. And that's when that's going to be particular. What are they, what, any questions on that? That was so easy, right? I got a dumb little question. I always wonder, what's the, the dip, is the only difference between a broadcast wave file and a wave file is you can type something, you can you just label put, it? Yeah, you just put. Is that the only major difference? Well, Technically, right now, right now, you can code you can code a wave. Now. A regular one, right? Yeah, you can code a wave now. Yeah. The only, here's the the problem with it is, is that you can code a wave all day, but because the most standardized version of identification for audio is iTunes and Windows Media Player. I mean, iTunes is huge. And Windows Media Player is also huge. Other than that, there's not a huge, there's not really many other like when you're thinking I want to play audio on my computer. There aren't a whole lot of other variables that are those that, that are that strong. There's Rhapsody and all that kind of stuff. But even then, that's designed as a it still as a more of a streaming facilitator, not necessarily a place that you usually harbor. So there's there are other ones, but those are the two dominant ones. Okay, so follow me on this. You label your wave. You send it to someone to put it in iTunes. If you didn't label it in iTunes, none of that ID information will, will come through because it's not identifiable to iTunes. So if you do, now that you're able to identify a wave and put all the label information, you have the broadcast file always ability to do that. You still have to have something that will receive it and be able to view it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can, you can label your audio all day, but if there's nothing on the other side to actually look at all that information, then it's useless. So that's the crappy part. You have to pick a meme. Can people change that? So can put them, can put oh yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah, here's the catch. Um, you, when you, and this, you can do that on any digital media file. If you can lock any one of them, but once you lock them, they're not transferable. So they have to stay unlocked to transfer. So the only other way you can fix IDs is when you physically print it on a DVD or on a Blu-ray or on a CD. When it's printed and it's fixed in a printed form, the IDs are printed and they're fixed. And there's no way to change it. That's the only way. Otherwise, as soon as it gets ripped off of that or as soon as it gets digital, it's just the same way you relabel any other file name, it's accessible. And then you can do it all day. Now, in that regard, that's why it's, it used to be a huge deal. When I was in college, it was like, 
Red Book labeling for CDs was such a big deal. You know, I, you know, now that doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters is the ISBN code, but those only go, get carried on if you sell a product. And guess what? If you're selling the product, who are you selling it with? Do you want to sell music? Who do you sell it with? Yeah, how do you sell? Amazon. Yeah, if you want to sell music, if the ISBN gets put on the Amazon catalog, the ISBN gets put on the iTunes catalog, the iTunes, uh, the ISBN goes on a CD that gets back to them. So whoever the catalog holder is, is the only one that identifies it, and it won't matter if someone takes it and relabels it, because it's not going to go back into their catalog. They're the only, their catalog is an output distribution, it's not an input distribution. So. So, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Sorry about making this so long. <laughs> Does that make sense, though? Yeah, yeah, that appreciate you. So, what did I give you? Clock source. Okay, you want to talk about it? Well, I never came across clock source because of that, so I don't even like, know what. Okay. What it is. Bingo. Clock source is, you got your master clock, right? Yep. And that connects, it synchronizes with every other instrument that you're using. So it's all on the same time code, right? Yeah, uh, mostly, kind of, and yes. Lots of different things. So you're on the right track. Let's just talk about this. Clock source, at this point in time, I don't even know if, yours, if, the, if your little inboxes even give you an option for this. Um, oh, the, you know what, you guys have a, you probably have a spit and a word clock, but you don't have optical. Clock source will only be needed it's always internal unless you add anything additionally to the setup that includes another interface or anything else that's digital. I was explaining the word clock, right? What's that? Isn't that what I was explaining was the word clock? Well, actually, what you were explaining is any one of those three. Or, yeah, it's just who uses it is the, the question. Or, it, 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 so all of those, which you mentioned, which Mike mentioned, are optional through SPDIF, optical, or word clock, and it's based upon which devices carry what type of clock syncing that makes you decide which one you want to use. Great example. Um, back when I was a kid, the first album I recorded, uh, I was a trumpet player when I was growing up, so I actually played trumpet for an album. I was like, I don't know, 15. It was all the tape back then. And what they would do is they'd put it all in multi-track tape, and when they were done with it, they'd dump all that multi-track tape to one little ADAT as a master. And the ADAT was just like a regular, I mean, it looked like a cassette tape, except it was higher quality. So it was a cassette tape. And they had to run all that stuff, they play all of it, and it gets literally, it's, it just gets recorded to two tracks on this thing, and then this is the one that gets sent to the duplicator. So when you wanted to burn CDs, you sent a tape. It's kind of funny, but you sent a tape to the CD manufacturer. They transition it to CD. So, well, all that to say, those tape decks, because of the way that they get encoded, they, even though their tape, it were they were based upon ADAT digital, okay, Alesis digital audio tape, digital tape. The multi tracks were digital tape. So they had anytime you do digital, guess what? You have sample rates, snapshots. The big catch is all the snapshots have to align with each other. So when this thing is referencing snapshot number one of the first second, it has to match snapshot number one of the, the device that it's going to. And that is SPIT, RCA. Sony Phillips Digital Interface. Right? That's, our, that's that. Word clock, same kind of concept, except it uses a BNC cable. And you'll see these, uh, we actually have BNC tape uh, here, I'll show it to you. It's the same idea. It's just anytime you're using a multi, multiple interfaces, you just need them to talk together. So if we wanted to link up these two interfaces to each other, hey, it's doable, but guess what the catch is? The catch is they have to capture the same sample rates at the same time. Otherwise, they cause a thing called jitter, which essentially makes it sound like things kind of go with audio. Now, if you look at these tails, there's a cluster of tails. You can just turn around and look behind you, right behind you there. There's a cluster of tails hanging out the top. Now, I know it's kind of confusing. What they did with this is when they wired these, they threw this. There's a multi-pin on the back of the M Audio device. It's this little multi-pin. looks like a, like a PC adapter, like you see on a computer. On the back of the, go to the inbox. See on the back of the inbox, off to the left? Keep going left. Yeah, uh, no, it's already plugged in. It's that thing that's plugged in. Almost, yeah, almost looks like a video monitor thing. Yeah, that thing. Yeah, exactly. What that is, is that's holding this chunk of tails. That little tail breakout, 
has MIDI, okay, the thing coming up through the table, you see MIDI, right? If you see the little thing that has little notches on it, that's called BNC. See the, see the silver ones with little notches on them? Those are called BNC connectors. That is word clock. Yeah, the one that has the RCAs, the little gold tipped ones, those are Sony Philips digital interface, SPDIF. That's SPDIF clock. So you have right here, you have SPDIF clock, you have word clock, and then guess what? You have MIDI clock. Essentially, that's why that, that reference just said word, well, it says word clock, but that's all those clock, those are all the clocking systems. So all that's, all that's doing is it's syncing devices from one to another. Now you need to know that because when you go over to the studio, you start working with the larger format stuff, you actually have to select the clock source to say, hey, this clock is in charge of all these. Because once you go to HD, you're using more than one interface, and once you're using more than one interface, we have to have one overall clock that syncs them all together. So, you guys got that so far? So we'll always be internal when we're just using so one. So if you click on a word clock, you gotta grab these two and hook this up to something? Yep. Alright. Yeah, and it depends. You'll see when you look real close, one of them's an in and the other one's an out. It depends on if you're sending. If you're the master, you send the clock. If you're the slave, you receive the clock. And you have to take it from some device. And here's how I clock at home. Kind of an interesting concept. I clock optically because you'll see there is such a thing, and it's real popular these days, as optical ADAT. And what optical ADAT is, and we'll talk about the 003, because that's how it uses it. These don't have it. Essentially, it uses fiber, fiber optics, to send an additional eight tracks to the input. But those eight tracks, in order to sync to the input with the same clock, have to use some means of clocking, and they use it through the optical lens, or sent through the optical element, the fiber that goes in. So that's what that option's for. When I'm at home though, I have sometimes I sync a couple computers together so that I don't have to have one that's dying on me. I'll have one computer that's, this is Pro Tools and this one's running my video stuff. In order to do that, I have to say, hey Pro Tools, you're gonna have to send clock information to the video interface that'll then receive clock information. And that's when I use work on. What if you have a device that hooks up to each one of these? You can use them all. You just have to, you can use them all, you just have to actually go in and tell it which one's going to be responsible for what. See, because this is the simple version of it. All right. The more complicated, complicated version of what then happens is in the setup. When you go to peripherals, this is where all the synchronization, actually, you, the, the other elements of it. You have to pick which ports are being used. You have to decide who's, you know, this, this is a um, MIDI machine control, but this is an additional clock element you get to use. Uh, MIDI controllers use clocks, and then you have these port clocks that are able to be uh, attributed to consoles and stuff like that if you're clocking to a console. Yeah, so you, there's a lot of additional right, right, stuff that gets involved. Um, you'll get into that eventually, but 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 yeah, it's doable. It is absolutely doable. I'm getting tricky already. Yeah, but that's doable. Okay, so let me solidify some of the last things here. Okay? You guys are doing good, right? Brilliant so far. Your minds are enlightened. <laughs> okay, interleave. This is a big concept. It's a brand new concept of Pro Tools, but other systems have been kicking our butt at it all day. Okay, so let's get into interleave. And interleave is it, there's a simple answer, and then there's the the um, other answer. <laughs> all right, so so listen to this. Okay, I want you to understand something that we're going to get into. What we're going to get into eventually is we're going to get into facilitating what we call putting it to print or rendering, all right? Rendering meaning putting it to print outside of doing it as a bounce. All of you know how to bounce the disk, right? You guys know how to bounce the disk? Bounce the disk. That's how you're probably used to exporting stuff or finalizing stuff. Well, guess what? There's an easier way, and it's called putting it to print, and in some formats, it's called rendering. No, difference. Normalizing is a uh, normalizing is a means of kind of it consolidates or it facilitates a consolidation, but it does it at, at um, it says, hey, what is the highest peak level? Whatever that is, I'm just gonna make that. If it was the highest peak level of an audio was like negative 13, it's gonna say, let's make that zero now, so that the highest level is actually at the zero point, the highest, the loudest it could be. 
little different than putting than what we're going to talk about in this concept. Okay. okay? So when we get into, um, I teach 335 advanced synthesis sometimes. I love that class. We will go out and we'll say, hey, let's sample. We're going to sample that whole grand piano out there, and we're going to make it playable on this keyboard. So we go out there, we set up mics, we record every note by itself. And then we go in and play it loud, and then we play it soft, and then we play it somewhere in between. Well, when we're done with all that, we have to go into Pro Tools and cut them all up and make them all the same length. We'll, nor we'll actually, we'll normalize them for that portion. But we, we don't want to have to do a bounce every time we want them out. So, because when we're done, we want to be able to take them all and load them into Reason Set them to an NN19, which some of you guys know, some of you guys haven't gone through it yet. Load them onto the, essentially load them onto the sample playback, and then we'll just load them on, and we can program them which where they go, and then all of a sudden, we're able to play it right here in the box, and we can take it anywhere, and we can like really hand it off and say, hey, here's your file, go ahead and take that Baldwin with you anywhere you want to go, because we just sampled it, now you get to use it. So with that idea in mind, bouncing for all of those, it's an 88 key, right? How many? Variables that we do, you know, it's that times however many, it's a lot of variables, it's a lot of files. We don't want to bounce every time. Bouncing more than 100 times is annoying. So there is a simpler way. And in that simpler way comes one enlightening, enlightening element. When you do a bounce, you bounce to stereo what? Stereo interleave. What does it mean? Two sided by eight one? Yeah, well. Or is it nine and one? No, no, you're right. Terminology is a little weird. It essentially, it's two channels in one file. Okay, now let me point something out. That is, in, well, no, hold on. Interleaved means multiple channels in one file. When you download something on iTunes, how many files do they give you for one song? One, right? And is it stereo? Yeah, it's stereo, right? Yeah, well, when, well, when you go watch a DVD, in 5.1 surround, is that one file or is it six? Well, technically, there's a couple of complications that go into that, but really it is one, it's one interleaved file that's interleaved also to the video element. It's literally linked to the video element. So it kind of gets a little weird, but I want to show you what this really means. You understand the iTunes reference, right? Yeah. You only have one file, but yet there's just a left and a right channel, right? Does that make sense? Well, let's look at this. And I think I still have it up here because I've been using it to show students, so I hope it exists. Sorry, I'm just going to go to my folder here because I had it, and if I had it, had it still. of the full understanding of what I'm talking about. Okay? Uh, yeah, precipice. Yeah, you were being really on the verge, but but oh, oh, does it, it not exist here? Maybe it doesn't exist here. Oh, here. On the verge. On the verge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you arguing with that? On the precipice pissing me off. <laughs> 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 Here we go. This is it. This is a 5.1. Well, it's a soprano alto tenor bass. It was a choir part. 5.1 interleave. When you look down here, it's one file. And you look at the info. How many channels? Six. Six. So the catch is, it's not just stereo. It's multiple files. Essentially, multiple channels. Should I say multiple channels? So 5.1 gets put into one file. 
Yeah, so now that sounds all good and fine, but here's where it gets important. Pro Tools forever, 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 ever, uh, till just this last release, had been making it so that every time you recorded a stereo track, it recorded the left version and it recorded the right version. Now what it will do is if it's stereo or 5.1 or 7.1, I think it does include 9.1 now, if you record it and you select interleave, then anytime there's more than one channel on one track, it will always make it one file. Now there's good and bad about that. The good and bad about that is very simple. If you're always just going to use it as one file, it's good. If you're going to want to use it as separate files, it's bad. So you just got to be careful which way you capture it. So I like to use interleaves when I can. I just know that there are times where I'm looking at it, I'm like, I don't know if I want those to be all just one file because sometimes I actually want to take this part of that file and do something with it and then this part of that file and do something completely different with it. The reason why that may exist is, and that really comes down to making sure that you're tracking correctly. Sometimes when I'm doing drums and I have a stereo left and a stereo right, I will always run a mono instead of stereo. So essentially if I have a left channel and a right channel in my rooms or my overheads, I run them on separate channels and not together. I'll leave the interleaves selected, but I won't put them on stereo because I don't want them summed together. I want the one on this side and one on this side. The reason why? Because then I can process them differently one from another. So that if one of them, if like the variable between them is like, oh, you know, it's warmer on this side, but I want it to be, I want it to match this side because it's brighter on this side. So I want it to both be that bright. I'm going to have to process them independently. Isn't so, that how they did it before stereo too? Like the technique before stereo? Putting mono left, mono right? Essentially, yeah. Well, uh, and that's how we, we still do it that way today because it still represents, uh, it still represents a stereo representation as long as the, the output is stereo and they're given a pan position. And we're going to get into that because it kind of, there's a couple things that, I love highlighting this for people because they go, oh crap. You know, because there's a couple things that, stereo is a really, it's the hardest game you'll ever play. When you guys go to 275 and you get into 5.1, that's easy stuff. It's killer, though, I'll tell you that. I, I have so much fun watching the students do projects for that because it's like anything you can think of, you have a whole circular space. The problem with it is, is that when you're mixing music, you don't get to mix in a circular space. You get to mix in a flat space. You only have two options. It's either it's left or it's right, or it's in between. So figuring out how to work with the space that you've got is going to be very important. Now, that leads me to this. So interleave, just so you know, interleave, if the option is not selected, it's recording a left and a right, and if we did 5.1, it's all individual channels, and when we go to the audio files folder, you'll see it represented that way. If it is interleaved, they'll be joined and they'll just be one file. You can select this or deselect this at any time. So you can turn it on and off, just whatever option it is at the time that you record will be the way it gets put in. So if it's off, each channel has a separate file? Yep. Yeah, so, well, and I can actually show you because this wouldn't be hard. So if I do Command Shift in, which is what? What's that command? Create a new track. Yeah, new track. Now, a couple things to add to that. When you go Command down, you select the type of file. When you go command left over right, you select stereo and mono, or 5.1. And I'm actually going to go to 5.1 real quick so you can see this. I'm going to make a 5.1 file. I don't have any inputs for it. Uh, well, I do, but I don't. Uh, let, me, let me set the inputs up so that they're usable. Interface. Sorry, this is a long story on this one, but I just have to jump in here and do a couple of things. Because otherwise, it's I actually have to make a 5.1 input, so I'm going to delete these. And we're going to go over this because this is what we're doing in chapter one. Uh, new path, 5.1. So call 5.1 input. And then I need to assign it. Okay, so you ready for this? I'm just going to call this track surround. All right, and I'm going to record. Uh, oh, well, that's not too bad. Oh. Was it a Well, yeah, when I was showing you the example, I lost my, my, 
Well, we're gonna we're gonna go over this today as well. This is gonna be what we did first. Um, it's gonna be you know what? I'm gonna skip it, but I'm but I am gonna I'm just gonna pick one so I can get this done. Alright. So technically what you're seeing there is a representation of the built-in inputs, which I don't know why they're active in the first place, but I'll, um, we're going to be working on remapping our I.O. today so you see what it looks like to remap your I.O. The whole purpose I'm bringing this up is right now I'm in interleave and I'm going to record. All right? So I'm recording five, uh, six channels, 5.1, right? So now if I stop this and I go to the finder and I jump back to wherever I'm saving this stuff, which for me it's down here from the over here, oops. Uh, there we go, we one, audio files. How many files? One. one. See that? So as soon as I disengage this, start recording again. How many files? It's all the ones that say two. That's the second version of it. Yeah, six. Left, right, center, sub, low frequency enhancement, LFD, which is what stands for. Left, around, right, center. So. Does it record like that? Like left, right, back there? Yeah, it will. Well, it will if you set it up. Does it have mics and all that? Or? Well, what you'll do, you. Well, there's not even a simplified version of this. So realistically, if you want to do a soundscape very easily, okay, and you want to do it in 5.1, a lot of times what you'll do is just, and it's only for atmosphere, because it's real hard to do this for any other reason, okay? Uh, well, except I did see somebody do this on a jet, like, like, or a, even a helicopter would be cool. You could do this on a helicopter, although you'd have to station your stuff real close. Literally, literally it's only for something you're trying to build a, a soundscape for, so just atmosphere. It wouldn't work for, like, dialogue to record it that way, but you could set up mics in the positions, in, in essentially in a circular position that would represent those particular positions in an atmosphere, and it would capture them as long as you pan them to those, those positions when you're done with them, then yeah, it's totally worth doing. I mean, you go if you're trying to use a plug in. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can use a plug in to do the surround. It, it would only behoove you to do this if there's movement. Yeah. You know, if you want to get a good, if you actually want to get the Doppler effect from something directly instead of having to make it okay. in post, you know, you could, you could do that. But you'd actually still have to have something moving and, and have to capture it the right way. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so it's kind of yes and no. It's, it's a lot of times most people don't do those Yeah, it could sound cool. But anyway, all that to say, that's what interleave does. You got that? All right, now the last thing we're going to do, and then we're going to jump to the next, to, to chapter one, where you get into all the details. All right, pan depth. By default, Pro Tools is at a negative 3 dB pan depth. But notice negative 6 is offered, and negative 6 dB is representative of analog panners. So you're going you're to want to use negative 6 as your pan depth, any option or time that you get. A lot of people are like, well, what the heck does that mean? Here's what it means. It just means that the difference between the zero center point and the all the way left or all the way right points are negative 6 dBs in, term, in terms of the degree at which it gets it lost as it, as it moves off to the side. So when you do that, a negative 3, really, it still feels wide like this but there's less variation to the middle. In negative six, it's the same place on the outside, but there's more refined variation to the middle, which means when you put something at like 30, and then you put something at 50, and then you put something at 100, when it goes to negative six, they're spread out more, and it makes it feel like it's wider. So it just makes it feel like it's wider. So always put it at negative six? Yeah, it's preferable. Now that it's an option, absolutely. That doesn't take away any file space. There's no file space lost there. It, it just gives you a bigger field. Now here's the catch. Catch is, if you're not good at panning, negative six won't help you. If you're not good, like if you're not a great panner, if you don't, if you don't really look at your stuff and go, oh, here we go, that needs a panning there, and there's a panning there, and this is how this fits there. If you're not good at that, negative six will not help you. Yes, some stuff up. <laughs> so you just have to understand how to pan. Okay. So that's that's just a 
you know, uh, it, it, the majority of the people that have problems panning are people who do a lot of work with beats and things that were made only that that their access to it is only from in the box. If they were using external things, then it helps. But the reason why is because a lot of people, and we'll go over this later. A lot of people in the industry will see a stereo file and they'll go, oh, we have to do the stereo. But the real question is, is if it was sampled in stereo, is, is the stereo field worth using in the first place? Great example, kick. A lot of people use a stereo kick when they don't need to because guess what? If the stereo kick is just all the way left and all the way right and there's no image, meaning there's no delay from one side to the other, hard left and hard right, act, and if they're equal, equals zero. Hard left, hard right equals zero, which means they're technically, even though it's hard left, hard right, it's down the middle. So a lot of times you'll get people that are doing everything hard left, hard right, and if you do everything hard left, hard right, you know, if you do, like let's say we took 10 stereo files, you have stereo kick, stereo snare, stereo, all the stereo stuff, stereo keyboard, if, it's, if there's no difference between the two sides, and they're all hard left, hard right, they all just went down the middle, which is why it sounds so choked. So you actually, even when you're working with the hard left, hard right stereo, you have to shift it and take one of the sides and pull them in so it feels like it's still more, it's still left and right, but it's a little less right than it is left in order to give it a space here and a space there. So that's really where the complication comes in. We're gonna work with that a little more so you guys can get some little bit. Anyway, that is this, and this setup has to be dialed in to your specifics. Because guess what? Do you want a better dynamic resolution? Yeah, how do you get it? Go to 32. Do you want a better, uh, uh, essentially, way of having your files instead of always be 10 files or two files per every stereo? Do you want to be one file? How do you do it? Do you want your panners to be wider? How do you do it? This is it. What was the command to get to this window? And two. Yes, sir. Man, too. All right. So we're going to get into the front end of this chapter one. All right. And we're going to go to talking about paths and subpaths of the I.O. And then when we're done with this, and actually, I was hoping to get to chapter two today, but that's right. I forget that when I really originally wrote the lesson plan for week one, we can't make it. It's just too tight because we still have to review. We just had to review some things and make sure everybody's savvy on the understanding of what it means to do certain things. Okay, so. So, here's where we're gonna go. And, uh, and we'll take a break in 20 minutes, okay? Here's where we're gonna go. Please go to setup. IO. Now what does IO stand for? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now there's two levels of input out. There is, well, there's really three. Okay. Three levels of input output. This device right here has its own I.O. assigned to it based upon how many inputs and outputs are there. Now, to kind of give you an idea, Avid products don't really use the number system the same way other, other systems do. But any small, any low budget, actually not low budget, but like anything less than $1,000 in an interface world, the numbers that are assigned to the model represent the in and the out. So when you look online at interfaces, you'll see something like uh, the Profire 610. It's six in, 10 out. You look up the 20, Profire 2424, 24 in, 24 out. You look up, uh, they have the Mix 88s, which were 8 in, 8 out, and 8 inserts. A lot of them are done in that format if they're typically somewhere under a grain. So you'll see like a fast track. You'll see a fast track 2 by 2 I mean 2 in, 2 out. A lot of times I'll put those numbers directly together, so those numbers are together. But notice the 003, that doesn't make any sense. The 003 was just the third gen. There was a 001, there was a 002, and then there was a 003. And they didn't really follow that suit. Now, so you do need to know this because you will want to understand this as you buy, and then of course as you become a consumer and you shop around. When it gets to HD audio interfaces, so the HD, all the stuff that does HD, like full HD, then it's based upon the HD number. So if you buy it, if you buy an interface that's 90, it's called a 96, 
guess what kind of resolution it does? 96. You buy an interface called the 192, guess what kind of resolution it does? 192. And Apogee makes a 192, Avid makes a 192, RME makes a 192. I mean, you name it, any of the big companies, Drummer even makes a 192. Uh, gosh, Mark of the Unicorn, Mo2 makes a 192. I mean, you look at the numbers, go look at the number series, you'll see all the HD ones use 96 and 192 as their number system. All the ones that are lower, the lower class ones, they may do up to 96, but the lower class ones are usually the, that number system. How many in, how many out? The reason why is because high res, the, all the HD ones are typically a eight, either 8x8 eight eight or a 16x16, 16 16, and they're made to be linked to each other. So it really doesn't matter how many ins or outs because you're gonna you're gonna buy a bunch of them anyway and link them all together. Because that because usually when you're in that world you have a budget you actually have it. Anyway, all that to say, there's in and out on the hardware. Then there's in and out on the software setup which we are gonna do now, and then there's the in and out on the track. So like what I mean by that is the third one is when you go to the mix window and you actually look at in versus out. And the only way you get to set these up or modify these is done by the internal in and out of the setup. So let's go to I.O. in the setup. And let's start with the input tab. This is kind of a long story, so we're going to get to it. All right, you there? Yeah. Everybody's there? Sorry, I just can't see you guys. So I can't see you. So, all right, cool. All right, so here's the catch. We need this to look like the interface that we're attached to. Now, most of yours are already done that, okay? But mine didn't do it that way, and mine got jacked up. And I won't, let me show you, actually, I'll show you this one. Here's a great thing. Well, I'm gonna fix, yeah. Don't mind what I do until I show you this, okay? So just ignore what I'm about to do. All right, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Okay, now, look at it. This is the standard setup for the 003. How many inputs do I have? And the number actually doesn't come from this listing, it comes from this listing. 18. 18, yeah. I have eight analog that are attached to it. I have the option if I opti optically connect another interface to it, to have 16, and then SPIF is a digital connection, so I get two more. Well, watch what happens. I'm on the 003, mind you. I'm gonna switch to my build to my Pro Tools aggregate. Now notice when I switch, it's gonna make me uh, close the session and reopen, but I want to show you the effect. Your I/O setup has changed since the last time the session was saved, which is exactly what just happened. When I change the interface that's being used, I also change how many options I have for I/O. Here's the problem: this is showing me my I/O options. Here's my input. But guess what? It didn't change what was shown off to the left here. It still thinks I'm going to use optical for my extra 16, my extra 8. So this is crap. I mean, literally, this isn't right. So ignore what I'm going to do again, but I'm going to show you why all this even mattered in the first place. Now I'm going to go back to the O3, and it's going to be jacked. So I need to fix it, and I'm going to show you exactly what you have to get used to doing when you do this. Because this does change. And if I go to odds on, and I'm like, crap, someone changed the I.O. on me, and I have to redesign it, and that's it. But guess what? There are easy ways to do it, and that's what I'm showing you. So going on to the I.O., look at this. Now on the 003, how many inputs do I have? Eight, four. <laughs> yeah. Technically, it shows 18 optional, but because these are the only ones that actually show up, then I have a problem. So here's what I do. Go ahead and do this with me, please. Do what I do with me, all right? Off to the left, please click inside the first name underneath this name listing right here where it says price is analog one or analog one and two. It's the first one. Highlight it so it's blue. Hold shift and click the last one. Hold shift and go down and click the last of the listing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another thing you could do is, and just so you know, because this is going to be functional with Pro Tools all together, sure. you can also hit option. Control uh, loss. For this, no, no, it's not going to Well, it'll, here, watch that. 
Control is going to make it go exclusively to one or the other. So whole option will do them all. So that's yeah. also an option. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to delete these paths. And these are known as paths, OK? And if I hit this little arrow off to the left, what's listed below is known as a subpath. And what you'll notice is a single path is a combination of a left and a right in stereo. And subpath is the individual mono versions of them. And we need those so that we can, if we want to do stereo ends, we can do stereo ends. If we want to do mono ends, we can do mono ends. We still have access to both. For now, please go ahead and hit the lead path. You'll have nothing on there. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to actually hit, what, what we'll do is as soon as we have the right interface connected, if you ever have an I.O. problem, all you have to do is hit default. It'll recognize it, and it'll list. Go ahead and hit default. It'll list it just the way it's supposed to be done. So see how everything came back? You'll do the same thing with the outputs. If the outputs get jacked, you're going to do the same thing. So for now, let's go to our outputs. Hit delete path. It's going to give you a warning if you have any tracks open, but you probably don't. Just hit delete. Just, yeah, just hit OK. No, what does it say? Yeah, hit delete. And then hit default. Okay. Now, guess what? This is a really interesting thing. At the output stage, and you're going to learn this when you get the surround sound, but you don't have to do this, but watch what happens. I'm going to delete the path. See down here where it says default monitor format? And by monitor, it means output. Sorry, I'll put this higher. Default monitor format, stereo. If I change this, and I totally can, I could make it 5.1 or 7.1. That's most of the picture, right? Simply. Mm -hmm. Yep, so 5.1. If I want to make this, the outputs be 5.1, the only way we can make it surround sound is if we actually make it a 5.1 output path. So we have to hit, put this as a default. And then hit default, and guess what it does? It says main, 5.1, L, R, C, L, P, L, S, R. And that's how we get to that. Beautiful part about that is that's how, and I'm just going to hit OK for example sleep. That's how we gain access. That's how we gain access to panners for the surround output option. Um, actually, let's see. So watch what happens. This is pretty brilliant. I'm just going to make a mono audio path. All right, and I'm going to hit this little guy. And uh, I'm going to go output to surround. And this, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's an interesting secret. The only way you can get a surround panner, see how I have a surround panner? This is a surround panner. Left, center, right, le uh, right surround, left surround, and then sub. This is the only way I get this, is only if I make an output that is a 5.1. Did you see how I made the output 5.1? You guys saw how I did it? The only way to do it is in the I.O., in the output, I actually have to say, hey, the default monitor is a 5.1. And then I had to clear the path, and I had to hit default. Now, of course, that's not what I want, so I'm going to go back to standard surround, or uh, stereo, so I'm going to get rid of all this crap. Hit delete, hit default. It's going to say, hey, do you really want to do that? I'm going to say, heck yeah, because I'm not sure. All right, does that make sense? Now, questions on this? Yeah, it's pretty simple, right? You can go ahead and rename these, which you'll do as part of your the exercise. You can jump in and rename these. Now, this is what gets weird. This is where, it, this is brilliant. What they did with this was brilliant, but guess what? It got so brilliant, when, I, when they, they updated our campus to Pro Tools 9. This is when this changed, what I'm about to show you. Problem was, when they released the updates for Pro Tools, they, they always put out like an update manual and says, hey, just FYI, this is what changed. This was in there, but it was in no shape, way, or form. A, they never said, hey, this is a big deal. It was just in there with all the other stuff. That was little additions. Oh, here's how you do this, and here's a little bit of this, and then here's this. Well, first time they did this at odds on, I don't know if you forget. You guys ever been over there? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a big studio. When they did theirs, they had no clue. They spent like a week trying to figure out what happened to their system. Because no, they didn't highlight that this is such a big deal. So what I'm about to show you is, is kind of a big deal, okay? 
these are your outputs. See this? These are your outputs, because we're in the output tab, right? Mm -hmm. But if I go to bus, this is where the outputs, these are your outputs, the busing meaning outputs. These outputs are actually attached to whatever's over here on the right. So see where it says mapping to output? Which means that what they were having problems with is when they originally set this up, these outputs were not correct. These outputs were something totally different that they weren't ever supposed to be. Someone had gone in and made manual outputs on these and they got they were like this, all wacky. Which meant that output one and two was going to eight at one and two, which it should have been. It should have just been output one and two to output one and two. A one and, or analog one and two to analog one and two. What it should have been. So the easy way to fix this, if you're looking at it and you're going, man, it doesn't seem to be right, is guess. Anybody have a guess? Equal. Yeah. Option click, delete the path, and default. Now here's the catch. Output buses, internal buses. An output bus is an output. An internal bus is when you have a bus one, two, bus three, four, bus five. You guys have worked with buses to a certain degree, right? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. We're gonna get into it in depth, but that's an internal bus is when it's in, it's literally listed as a bus. Out internal bu uh, output bus is literally when it is an out, meaning it comes out the output of these inputs. So when we look at, this, at those analog out numbers, those refer to the numbers of the outputs off the interface itself. So I'm just gonna hit output bus to show you this for now. Default output bus. So now these are my outputs. So it's an analog one and two is an output, analog three and four, five and six, and all these. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering why the hell are there so many outputs in the first place? Anybody know the answer to that question? Is it X? Is it this way? The same that everyone's listening, that people can be listening to different things. Mm, okay. Is it signals? Kind of, kind of all of what you said. Here's what the reality of it is. The reality of, of Kind of the, the monitoring version, we usually do as an internal bus. So they're not these outputs per se, we can, but you know they are at the same time. It depends on what the interface is and what the interface can carry. But we have the option to do it in that format. So what you said is dead on to the degree that if we have an interface that'll do it, we can use it in that form. So like this, out, this inter these interfaces have six outs. The first two have to go to the stereo mix. The other four can essentially be used to make headphone mixes for you, or for you, or for you. We, there's a way to do that that has to get set up. Now the other addition is these other outputs can be 5.1. So 5.1, we need how many outputs? Six. Or six, yeah. So we can map these out as, as surround outputs, so we need all six. The other thing we can do is if we're mixing down to different things, we can use those in those formats. Now what you're talking about inserts. Uh, you said patch bay. Patch bay is not really necessarily the, the right version of this. If we think insert at, at, instead, we can actually use, and this is kind of brilliant, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but we can actually use, and I'm just going to cancel all this one more jumbo. In the plug, see this insert? These are plugins, right? Plugin. Notice there's a thing that says I.O. What this does is it allows us to use the physical I.O. We can't use any that, that are used. So one and two are always used by stereo out. But if we pick three, what it's going to do, of course, I can't do it now because I'm going to surround. I screwed up the surround zone. But if we pick three, what it'll do is it'll send it out output three, and it'll expect it to come back into input three. So you literally have a, a physical plug-in, not, not an actual plug-in. But I mean, you can take a physical compressor. Like if you have a, like a, an Avalon, or if you have a nice compressor and it's a, it's a real one, you can say, you know what, I want to put that on that track, and I'm going to put it as an I.O. Send it out one of the outputs, and send it back. Now the catch is you have to send it back to the same number input. So if it's going out of analog 3, it's going to go back into the analog 3. And how do you do it? Do you have to send it back to it? Yep. So you just plug it in as a, as a loop, um, and there you go. I mean, you can do all sorts of cool stuff with that. Um, one, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember what it's called. The uh, Chaos Pad? You familiar with Chaos Pad? Well, or Chaosolator. They're made by Korg, and what they are is they're these little touchscreen things that do filters and do weird effects, and you play audio through them. And a lot of turntable guys use them, a lot of guys that do 
different effects. You can actually route those into Pro Tools and go woo, 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 with all your options. And you can pick anything. It could be a vocal, it could be guitar, it could be drum, and you can you know, do what you want with it. But there's an example of why you might want to do it with a physical thing instead of having to do it inside of Pro Tools. A lot of different variables. Now, when you go to Odds On or when, when they finally get the studio upstairs, the other thing about multiple outputs is this. When you're mixing on an analog console, you actually have to route every channel track individually to an output. So if you have 16 tracks of, of something on there, each track, if you want them to end up separately on the analog console, have to go out their own output. So they have to go one, output one, output two, output three, output four, output five, and so on and so forth. So you'll learn more about that later, but that's what that's there for. So, any questions so far? All right, we're getting close, we'll take another break. All right, so back to the I.O. Now, here's where the brilliant part happens, okay? I'm gonna get rid of all this crap. Let me fix this. I forgot to change this. So I'm gonna delete. Bus, option click, delete, and default all buses. Now, before you do anything, please go to your bus listing. Yep, bus, and I want you to read me the number that you see that says active buses over the other number. What does it say? It's at the bottom. 128 over 256. Ha ha, all right. So, it's right, it's at the bottom. Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah, what is your saying? 226. Okay, great. That's good, okay? I don't know how often you look at specs for Pro Tools, but they change every time there's an update. And what they change to is higher numbers of everything. When I was first on Pro Tools, you could only do sit on, on an LE system, the lower, the cheaper systems, that's what these are really. You could only have 16 tracks at a time period. Um, they made, and here's what's crazy. When I was in college, they made a free version of Pro Tools you could just go online and download. But guess what? It only carried eight tracks. You can only do eight tracks at a time. Damn. At all. Which is cool for people who just want to play a guitar and vocal, but eight tracks is not much for most you know, real engineers. So, okay, so let's think about this. That was version four. When it got to version five, it went up to 32 tracks in LE. When it got to version, version 6, you could do an expansion to 48 tracks in LE. It got up to 7, it went to 64 tracks in LE. So we've been climbing, now we're at 9, now you can get 96 tracks right off the cuff. 96 tracks simultaneously, which is great, because that's a, about the size of a normal session. Now all that to say, the bus numbers of internal buses also went up. And what I mean by those is, is I know, you know we've been talking and having this conversation about this, but when we go here and we want to use a bus, oh, I just killed it. But and the output we can do with internal busing. We were having that conversation a little bit. We're going to get into what that all that means. But notice on your I/O, if you go to bus, it shows a number of how many are active, and the other number is how many are available. How many are available? Two hundred and fifty-six buses. That's mind blowing. Yeah, that's more. That's more power than you're ever going to need. I mean, that's even more, that's, honestly, Infinity. that's more tracks than you're even allowed to have, et cetera. Infinity. <laughs> yeah, that's way more than you're going to need. But guess what? If you want to activate, you, you said your number is what? 32? 36, yeah. Thir yeah. So, 32, 36. yeah, that means that only 32 have been activated. So if you want to activate the rest, all you have to do is go default all buses, and guess what it's going to do? 234 uh, now. Well, I mean, then, actually. What is the difference? How come his says 32 and Mark say 128? Because somewhere along the lines, his, must, his system must have gotten rid of buses. Essentially, somewhere along the lines, someone got rid of the buses. Well, and here's, here's the catch. Remember how I said restart your computer? The reason you have to learn this is even when you restart the computer, Pro Tools actually saves the last I/O setup that the last person used. So when they jack this up, you, if, if this is wrong, you have to go in and fix it. So when it's this up when we go when I first learned about that here. Yeah. Using check side of settings and stuff like that. I was messing everybody up. I think so. So what's the easy fix? Yeah, delete all of them, hit default. Does that make sense? So when you run it and you're like, oh this is all wrong, select them all, holding the option, hit click, delete, hit default. Done deal. That easy, right? Now, let's go into the other half of this, the other is 256. The other half of this group, I'll show you. The other half of this group that's missing 
is the one are the ones that you're able to, to make up your own names for from this new track listing in. Notice how it says bus, and down here it says track, and then it says new track. If you hit new track, it's actually going to route a bus, and it's going to make it as an aux input. As long as it says stereo aux input, it's going to make it whatever you name it. So let's just say we call this gay. It's almost 11. Yeah. All right, so that's a new bus. It routed the bus uh, bus output called yay, it's almost 11 p.m. in stereo, and it just made a new aux input for that bus. And guess where it shows up? In the bus listing, if I go all the way to the bottom, look, yeah, there's, our, there's a brand new bus that just got added. Yay, it's almost 11. Does that make sense? If you delete those and then default it, the A won't Yeah, it'll, it'll kill it. It'll be gone. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's a good thing to think about there is you can actually do them either way. You can do them like that, or you can jump in here and rename these. Uh, so let's just say I rename them. Okay, that's just essentially going to get saved as a bus name. this up so that because before on, an, on if you went and you decided hey I just bought I just bought a nice two thousand dollar compressor I want my compressor to be attached to this track in that IO remember I showed you how you make it as, a, as an IO thing you know like I want it to be there but I want to use the same automation I wrote for well before you had to wipe the automation and start fresh to even implement that now all you do is this. You say, hey, I wrote automation to bus 3-4. Let's say I wrote automation to bus 3-4, and you're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. What you can do is if you check it here, you can say, hey, I'm gonna use the analog 3-4 routing, and I'm gonna attach it to it. So it's, it's not an internal bus anymore, it's actually an external routed bus. So it'll route to an external device and come back, just the same way we had talked about earlier, but now instead of having to rewrite all the automation, you don't have to touch a thing. Essentially, also what it means is, if you ever use buses for a reverb, but if you ever do reverb buses or you do headphone mixes or whatever, go ahead and inserts. Well, yeah, but let's just say, okay, let's just say this. I'm gonna, let me show you a, a variation of what this would be. I'm just gonna make, I'm gonna make eight audio tracks, and I'm not gonna mind labeling them yet. And at, on these eight audio tracks, I'm going to attach all of them to a new bus track, and I'm going to call it Reverb. Okay? So I just bust them all to Reverb, and I'm going to move this. I'm going to show you how to do all this anyway, so don't be freaked out. Okay? So if I go into this view where I get to see their levels, this is these levels, these faders represent how much Reverb. So see how they're going to be variable? Right? See how they're all different now? Okay, so if I, in the old way to do this, if I wanted to make that not, not a built-in reverb, but I wanted to make it an external reverb, I actually had to go in and wipe out, like I literally had to go in and say, oh, I need to go to an output now, and route it in and out. Now, instead of doing all that, Jack, all I'm gonna do is go into IO and say, hey, you know what, the one that I just called reverb, Reverb, I can now just attach it. 
Oh. I can attach it to an, an external device. And I can say, hey, my external device is being routed through. Know, it's actually really good. That's what it's there for. I think it's brilliant because it, because I've been in a lot of mixed situations where it's like, dude, I killed myself to get that automation right. And the guy, the mixed engineer just said, what? There's no other way to route this, so I have to wipe it and I have to do it all over. And I'm like, really? That's blow. I mean, like, that just did not sound good. Like, now we have to go do it all. I have to sit there. I've been in a couple sessions where I was working with a mixed engineer and they're like, do you mind just right rewriting the automation real quick? And I'm like, yeah, I can do it, but I mean, like, it was already done before we got here. You know? And he's like, well, there's no other way to route it. Well, now there is. Now there is a way to keep all the automation and actually just remain the route. But that's what all that is. Now, here, now here's what I want to show you. This is a change. The inputs all have subpaths. You see how they have subpaths? Subpaths are literally just, notice it says analog one and two, and then it's just analog one, and then analog two. And then the grid, see how this grid works? When they're together, they're left and right, but when they're down here, they're mono. One of them is one, and one of them is two. On the output, the, this used to exist on the output. It doesn't anymore. See, there's no subpath on the output. The subpath for the output now exists in the bus. So if you go to bus and you click down, that's where you'll see this listing. So when you get into the exercise and it's talking about subpaths for the output, those are actually in the bus. So far, is it good? Yep. Yeah. All right. Where do you go 